Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be, it's an honor to be here. Um, well, as I was saying, um, I mean, as, as we were being introduced, um, I came to London in 2000 um, with, with not much of a plan um, except for setting up Raphael's office. And it was a wonderful learning curve and it was a wonderful opportunity to be given to a very young architect who knew very little at the time. Um, but it was um, this idea of uh, setting up an office when it's not your own um, is an incredibly, setting up an office in general is incredibly difficult. Um, and trying to understand how one sets up an office and how one goes and gets a project um, is also quite challenging. So when it came to the time that um, was right to set up my own practice, it, was, it sort of felt a lot smoother and a lot easier because I had gone through the difficulty of doing it once. Um, there are no themes to the projects. Uh, we don't have a preconceived um, dialogue or, or language, um, but we do have a few recurring themes that come along, and it's something that actually I discovered when we were putting together this 10-year uh, book um, to try to understand really what is it that we're doing. It was a very good exercise to do. Um, and there are a couple of subjects that keep reoccurring and keep coming back. Um, one of them is light as a building material. Um, and it is something that we try to work with and uh, light the way it's captured. The light has to be captured by a material. So here it is, um, it is mist. Um, light uh, has to reflect off of something. Uh, it gives a certain depth. Um, and then Jim Terrell, who is a um, master of light and has really sort of, um, I, th I think is being very copied by architects, but has, has shown a way to sort of create endless space, uh, boundless space uh, through the use of light. Um, other ways in terms of in a smaller scale, I think I like this Nando lamp very much in terms of that light can actually blur boundaries and... and uh, too, too close? Yeah. No, no, it's just dropping. Okay, wait, wait. Yeah. That's better. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, but it can, it can essentially break boundaries and, and sort of uh, um, uh, s uh, smooth the, the line between outside, inside, um, and edges. Um, another element that we work with is reflection and what reflection does very much like um, light reflection as a building material in terms that it, it, it uh, distorts space, it uh, creates, um, it makes buildings disappear, it makes certain parts of spaces disappear. And you can see here with the Matterhorn reflected in the, um, in the lake and how the ground plane now is no longer there and it sort of forms another uh, dimension to the space. Um, and then a third subject that we uh, play with is this uh, notion of unstable equilibrium um, and this idea that you don't quite understand how buildings stand up. So probably the opposite of, of structural um, um, uh, sort of uh, demonstration and sometimes we like to play with the idea that you don't quite understand how and why a building is the way it is. Um, one of the very early uh, examples of this notion of, of lightness and um, and materiality was in a, in a project we did in Switzerland. Um, it's a chalet, it's on a slope. That means that half the building is within uh, the ground, so very poor natural light, very low ceiling heights because of planning regulations, local planning regulations. And so we wanted to use the stair as a form that would capture the light. During the day, there's a, there's a light well up above, and at night there's a LED strip at the bottom, and it becomes essentially in the center of, of the space a, uh, a lantern as well as um, allowing the stair itself to be, feel very light as if it's floating within its space um, and children love it because they play behind it. Um, and then we, while we were doing Wellington College, which I'll show you in a, in a, uh, very soon, um, we were asked to provide a piece of art for a, uh, an exhibition called Living With Art. And so we decided to develop the uh, Wellington bench. And you'll understand why once you see the project. But this idea that concrete uh, can, made to be a, to, uh, can appear to be floating uh, above its ground. And so we built this bench. And it was completely experimental. We had no idea 
really how to do it. Um, it's actually aged okay, but uh, by creating this concrete with marble, um, using plexiglass as formwork to get this very, very smooth uh, effect, and then creating a light piece and putting a rubber piece underneath. And you can see here, this was a piece finally, and it just sort of sat there once you turn the light on, and it appears the, to have a block of concrete floating above the ground. So Wellington College was, uh, I'm showing you four projects, uh, very much on the performing arts. We have somehow since Wellington College have been um, getting a lot of performing arts building, and then I'll show you another project, the tower, which was a competition we won, um, but uh, still in very early stages. Uh, Wellington College was a competition that we were invited to. We were invited to at a later date. Uh, uh, there were four architects, and we were invited 10 days before it was, the competition was due to finish. And the school said, you may join, but you're not getting more time. So we literally had 10 days to do this project, which really meant that we had to sharpen our decision-making process and, and, and be very, very quick about it. Um, so I went to site thinking that I was going to apologize and say thank you very much, but no thank you, because I just didn't feel there was enough time. The brief came from this notion that the school with 900 students and its staff needed a, an assembly space of 1,200 seats, and currently they were doing it in three buildings and um, linking by video. Um, so they wanted one space that could, at assembly, have 1,200 capacity. Um, the site of the school was a, uh, the thing that really spoke to me when I went on site. It sat between this wonderful forest, this very dense forest um, of Crowthorn, and the historical setting, the, the edge of the campus. So you can see here um, the historical campus, the modern campus, this a little bit less successful than that one. Um, and then this space in between and the edge of the forest. So it was very much an edge site. Um, and it sort of had to bridge this kind of architecture with this kind of architecture. Um, and so we were trying to think of a way that this site could really help and become a hinge site to, to, uh, to the campus. Um, one of the things that Wellington developed was this moving away from the traditional way of teaching to a Harkness model. And then they developed this idea of eight aptitudes Anyway, that was something that very much informed our thinking about the building and about the shape of the building. Um, in terms of the social hubs on the school, there was one very uh, focused social hub, the, the VNA, which is a cafeteria, and all of the rest of the socializing happened within the boarding houses, so there weren't any other places. So what we wanted to create was a cultural quarter, a place for the students of the arts to come and gather and, and use a space that they could call their own and, and, um, and experiment with. Um, the existing uh, uh, theater was a 350-seat theater, and um, performing arts is very much about negotiating levels between stage, front of house, back of house, stalls, um, um, balconies. So it's a very sort of, you're constantly figuring out how to negotiate these levels, and this particular scheme had created a sunken auditorium and a foyer to f somehow negotiate the road and, and the level of the campus, which is a five meter difference. And I thought that was particularly unsuccessful and I, we called it the bear pit and we thought that the project should really be about resolving this problem on campus. Um, so the brief said that we should create a 1400 assembly at the time and put the foyer in the bear pit um, and then essentially link the old theater with the new assembly hall. And our view was that actually they, this was the wrong approach. We still had to negotiate these five meters, and therefore we were still having this issue of having to go down into an area and, um, and not resolving the problem. So our approach was very simple. We said, let's separate the hall from the theater, create a cultural square, or what we ended up calling the cultural living room, and creating a very soft sort of ramp-like access between the, level, the campus level of 100 and the street level, the, the trucks in and out at level 95. Um, so the separation of the two buildings and creating this cultural living room in between became really the crux of the building. One other aspect is that this is a historical campus with historical landscape, and so they had tried to get planning before with a large auditorium and were struggling with it, and so we thought that actually if we were to think of a round shape for the auditorium, both on, on the inside but also on the outside, a building that has no corners, that is constantly receding within its landscape and really becomes a hinge between the historical 
and the modern campus, it sort of felt very well, on, it sat very well on its site. Um, and then most importantly, this soft transition between the different level and this connection of the outside circulation with the inside circulation of the building. Um, and then by putting a theater grid above this cultural living room, then um, we were able to create a space that could be used by the students of the arts in all sorts of ways. So this was the original idea of the cultural living room and this could be somewhere where they could have a concert, hold a concert, an art exhibition, etc. So the idea was that the students would take that space over. Um, and then this notion of the, the natural light um, with the hall and we found this image on the internet, I have no idea what it is, but then we put some uh, forest around it, but this idea that you have an assembly space and you're very much connected to the campus outside and you have these views of the campus which are very different than what you would normally experience um, became an important part of the project. And you can see here, these were very early renderings. This was, these were actually competition renderings um, showing the um, cultural living room, so this soft ramp connecting the two. The original bear pit, this is the original theater, um, which will be a phase two. So for the moment, we've built phase one. It opened three weeks ago. Um, <clears throat> and then we essentially covered up the bear pit and we created what we called an educational plaza and then we created this cultural plaza in between and then this connection between the outside and the inside uh, circulation. What this does essentially, and this is how we convinced the planners very easily that this was a solution that could work on campus, is that the theatre really is this deep. It's a mammoth of a building. But by creating a building that lightly hovers above, uh, above its um, historical landscape and it sort of really pays homage to the landscape with the cladding receding back into the forest and sort of um, uh, connecting back to the forest as a hinge between the two campuses. It's sort of, um, I think the story was convincing enough that we were able to get planning relatively easily. And these are the early stages of the cultural living room and you can see this is the image that I like so much because this connection between level 100 and is much softer and much more open to this um, <clears throat> space that um, can be, and it, it essentially is a teaching space inside as well as outside during the day, and I'm sure they'll use it in ways that we haven't thought about. This was during construction, and this was me walking to the meeting here in the, in, in, in the site um, offices, but I like this very much because the building really has grown out of its forest and, and is part of it. We initially looked at <coughs> um, doing um, burnt wood, which is a Japanese method, which essentially um, makes the wood become fire resistant and insect resistant, but we felt that there weren't any supplies in the UK that were big enough or, um, let's say, reliable enough to take on such an enormous job. So then we reverted back to a, a more um, traditional method of staining the, the wood. But this irreg irregularity and this sort of this uh, uh, fudging of the edges became something that made it a little bit more organic and made it fit with uh, its um, landscape. This is, uh, in my office, we have these wonderful, very patient young architects and um, every single uh, piece had to be designed and codified, et cetera, et cetera, to give this irregularity and um, give this notion that you can't really, <coughs> you can't feel a pattern this is on the opening. Um, we haven't yet photographed, so I'm sorry, these are all pictures from, from my iPhone. But this was a very exciting moment to see the building come alive. And you can see here this internal circulation, external circulation, um, and the wood, the cultural living room. Um, and you can see here, this is you know, how people talk to each other as they're going in and out, and how this um, walk, this ramped walk towards the entrance um, uh, works nicely. And here we are on the inside. The, I, I don't think I've, I should have put a slide about this. The budget was incredibly tight. Essentially there was no money for this uh, project. But, so it, it forced us to come up with uh, solutions that were very cost effective and yet uh, could work for the, 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 the building type. Now, this balcony front here, let me find a picture. This balcony front here 
had to have different degrees of inclination for the first reflections of, uh, for acoustic reasons. So you can see here this is quite a vertical condition and it sort of angles itself throughout. And so we created, we were, we, we tr double curvature was just not affordable. And so we created this language of, of uh, balcony fronts that would allow the acoustic reflections uh, to perform as they should. So that's Wellington that completed two or three weeks ago um, and is now, I think the school is trying to learn how to use this new car that they have. Uh, Andermatt Concert Hall came shortly afterwards, uh, a very different type of um, project. It's in, um, I grew up in Switzerland, I grew up in the mountains, so it's sort of very familiar to me, this whole, uh, this whole environment. And, um, and we actually have two projects there, but I'll just talk to you about this one. Uh, it's really in the middle of Switzerland, and Ori is one of the three cantons that were the founding ca cantons of Switzerland. So even though the population of Uri is only 56,000 people, it's a very powerful canton. Um, it's very close to Lucerne, and there's a concert hall by uh, Jean Nouvel there, the KKL, which has a summer festival. And, uh, and the client who is developing this new resort, um, little by little, wanted to create a concert hall that would extend the KKL Summer Festival into Andermatt as, as a, a concert venue. Um, they, had, they were in the process of building a hotel, and they had uh, given us a hall which was in the basement, um, in terms of plan was quite uh, okay, but in terms of ceiling height was really problematic. And the client was convinced that um, this was enough for a concert, and, and I was absolutely not convinced because of this uh, particular issue. A week before um, uh, starting on this project, I had just been to the uh, Divan opening in Berlin. This is a, a hall done uh, for Baron by Frank Gehry, exactly the same plan, uh, but the, you can see that the ceiling height inside the hall is more than twice the height. So I asked the client to come to hear a concert there and understand what the height would really do to the music. And I think that once you're sitting there and you listen to the music, you understand how important the, the, the volume is uh, in terms of acoustic requirements. So we were limited by planning in terms of how where we could go up, but the solution really was to go up. Uh, we were given one year to complete this project, so we couldn't dig down because that would have been too costly, too lengthy. And so um, we proposed to go up with the roof to get the right ceiling height and then increase the volume at the back by essentially creating this backpack. We had to hang everything on existing structures. We couldn't put more foundations for cost and technical reasons. Um, of the earth, and so we came up with a solution of a backpack and an increased uh, roof height. And then most importantly, because it is quite a small hall and the ambition of the client was to get large orchestras, um, we wanted to get this uh, extended vision, so we created a glass, a sheet of glass that wraps around um, the upper, f uh, upper level of the roof and allows a view to the outside. And so essentially by standing there and seeing beyond, the space intrinsically feels bigger and sounds bigger. Um, this was a very first sketch that uh, we drew and this idea that there is something that happens below that you don't see and we just by creating this roof up above and, and hanging these acoustic reflectors as pedestrians are walking here from the village uh, towards the mountain, they will see this and be able to look into the hall and see what is, what is happening and sort of, uh, I guess, be enthused by it. Um, one of the other elements that we did initially, they had planned a stage here and just rows of seats um, um, in a more traditional shoebox kind of uh, a way. And what we uh, asked is that we move the stage uh, to a center so that we really have the audience wrap, it, uh, wrap themselves around the orchestra and sort of creating a much more uh, human kind of experience. Um, and then this is some of the early um, acoustic diagrams with this notion that there is a wave of a building that allows um, uh, the, the sound to be um, uh, essentially moved around, around the, the space. This is a, so this is an early view before the roof was raised and you can see this is the unhappy architect. This is me sitting here going, this is not gonna work. And this is a view with the happy architect now same view, so you can see here how we cut the roof along here, 
essentially we then created this backpack and you can see here this, the massive beam that takes the load of the backpack down into the existing foundations um, and this uh, overarching roof and this window. So it's essentially as you come into the building, you go down into darkness, you go down into the basement, and then you get into the hall and you're back into lightness and, and space. And this is, an, uh, this is a rendering. So this is what it uh, looks like from, from as you walk through, through, through to the village, from the mountain to the village with the acoustic reflectors um, hanging over it. Uh, the plans are, are very simple. We had to uh, be able to change from conference to wedding venues to rock and roll to um, classical concert. The main use is classical concert. And um, they are now developing a wonderful program with the Berlin Philharmonic coming and Barenboim coming. And so it's all very exciting um, in terms of uh, the, the kind of program they're developing. Um, so low floor, this is the ground floor with the passage, the acoustic reflectors and the balcony levels. Um, an elevation, it looks like a tiny building when you're outside of it. And in fact, this is the section through the building. So you can see here how the seating um, is organized. And I think that uh, we have the artist in the room for this drawing, um, but some of the views. And so we're right in the middle of construction. It's supposed to finish at the end of March. Let's see. Um, but it's a very exciting project for us. What I particularly liked about this, uh, this glass and this idea that people could look into the auditorium, and of course there's a curtain, and of course you can close it off if you want the privacy, but I hope they won't. Um, and especially this is a very rough mountainous area and when it snows you can't see and the, the, the snow is swirling and there's nothing more beautiful than that. And I was just hoping that they could have some concerts with a snowstorm outside and it would just all be so dramatic. Um, so let's hope for bad weather. <laughs> and this was two weeks ago. So Boxtor, this is a project that we've, we, we inherited or we, we won very, very early, so I think one year into opening the office. It's, a, it's, a very, it's probably still our largest project. It is our most complicated uh, project that tries our patience. We've been working, I've been working on it now for since 2006, so 12 years. It's Lithuania. It's a very interesting place to work because it's, uh, it's a new country, so only since 91 have they really formed a government and are governing themselves, which means that in planning, they were try getting rid of the Soviet uh, planning regulations and adopting new ones. This is our, oops, sorry. This is our complex. The old town of Vilnius is a world, world heritage site, so by nature, our site is as well a world heritage site. Um, the regeneration of Vilnius occurred along this one spine and, and stopped. So all of this area was not regenerated and then there was another regeneration happening here. And we thought that in order to link those two um, quarters or these two areas, we needed to think of the brief. And we spent probably a year thinking about what the brief should be um, through all sorts of uh, uh, trials. But the, the, the history of the site was that it used to be a cardinal's palace, a Polish cardinal's palace, then it became a monastery and then it became a venereal disease hospital through the Soviet time and since 91 has been sitting in this repair and we found it in this incredibly poor condition um, where uh, literally everything was cracking and, and uh, but very simple, very uh, very simple Baroque, very uh, 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 elegant Baroque. It's not like the Austrian Baroque, which is, is very rich. This is a, Lithuania was never a rich country and it sort of reflects in its architecture. Proportionally also very, very wonderful buildings to work with. Um, and, uh, and essentially we had to convince the planners, this was the biggest part of, of the di difficult, most difficult part of this was to convince the planners that we can do a contemporary intervention with this without necessarily um, hampering on the historical building. You can see here that these, these are the only drawings we really had to work from, so not very much, but the proportions of the roof and the building are very similar and very simple and very sort of bulky, and we wanted to retain this idea of the massive presence of the roof on top of a very simple building. 
Um, and we were given these uh, uh, chromato chromatography drawings, which essentially um, ages every wall, and it, it tell, told us which areas of the buildings we could demolish or not demolish. And from that, we created a preservation plan that showed what were the assets of the building that we should really retain and, and, and um, uh, restore back to their original uh, uh, design and some of the later additions that essentially detracted from the original building that we should demolish. Um, and we then needed to uh, create some additional uh, insertions and rather, and we call them insertions rather than extensions. For example, we needed a fire stair and a lift in one of the buildings. We didn't want to put it on the inside because it would ruin the Baroque. And so we started talking about these insertions and that was probably the most difficult part to Past, to get past planning because they said in the old town, in the UNESCO World Heritage Sites, you cannot have new building and um, you essentially have to um, play with the existing fabric. So it was this dialogue with them where we created a few insertions, I think, here, here we go, a few insertions to make the buildings fit for purpose um, and we made them in a language that was very apparent and wasn't trying to mimic the old Baroque, and, but really played, had a dialogue with it. Um, and a massive excavation, this is the basement, and this is all Gothic basements, and we created a 21-meter 20, pool, and, and then we created an excavation for a sort of performance space and, and restaurant. But really, this was the image that we used to, to convince the planners that we should think of these as building and landscape, and how how the buildings that we are creating would somehow sit between the landscape and the buildings. Um, these courtyards are very much part of the language of, of, uh, of Vilnius, and so we wanted to play with that idea and through this notion of reflection. So for example, this one building, which is essentially just a fire stair and a lift, um, the way we treated it, we created a, a building, a, a, an object that sits in front in line with the tower, um, and essentially by creating a reflective surface, um, we were reflecting the Baroque rather than mimicking it. And we were playing with the um, historical buildings rather than uh, trying to imitate them or actually trying to be disruptive. Um, we just didn't feel that we needed to go that way. What I like about this image is that the solid becomes, disappears and the glass is the thing that becomes solid. Um, but you can see here, this is a, an early rendering, how the, this tower essentially disappears within its landscape and it becomes half landscape, half building, and um, reflects. And I don't know if this is going to work. There we go. But, <laughs> but the building, again, um, will reflect its context and will become animated. So this is uh, the building as of uh, last month. Um, the panels are coming from Japan. This is the happy climb, thank God. Um, and then we did the same for the other insertions where we had to, we were thinking about how to use all these enormous uh, cellars that they have and, and uh, by creating this restaurant. And they always, there's a lot of restaurants in Vilnius that we go down in the cellar and they're quite dark and not very appealing. And so we decided to excavate this auditorium in front of it and create a space that really opens up to its landscape um, just by creating this very soft um, uh, 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 sunken auditorium, I guess, a little bit like, uh, like Wellington and creating this space that could be a restaurant, it could be a performance space, etc., etc. And again, the roof is treated in a way that it reflects the historical building and sort of marries itself well between one and the other. We had the panels done in Japan and it's um, it's just because the quality of the, that, that company, they've actually done all this, the metal work on the Bloomberg building that just won the Sterling Prize, but they, the quality of, of the steel that they were proposing and, and, and the fabrication uh, was just so much better than anything that we saw. And uh, now the panels are all arriving in Lithuania and this is them being loaded in Japan and off they go. And um, they will be installed in the next couple of weeks. One of the other big elements that we had to convince the planners with is that um, the half of the building really is in the roof and the Hall of Vilnius um, exists with uh, apartments, residential offices in the roofs and what they've been doing is putting V-luxes everywhere and we were, um, the, the planning regulation said that the roofs had to be 
play tiles and Veluxes were allowed. And we argued that actually Veluxes were a radical invention 50 years ago. They don't go with the Baroque. They detract from the Baroque. And actually, what you really need is a solid roof with a solid base. And we wanted to return to that. So we proposed essentially a metal structure, a very simple metal structure in front of it. And just by putting the glass behind the metal, you don't have a reflection. So you don't have this blue. Um, reflection of the, the Velux, and you can see here this is a mock-up that we did um, on, on, uh, on site. And then once we showed this to the planners, uh, they accepted it. But it took about three years to convince them. It was quite a difficult process. They were quite conservative about it. But, um, um, and you can see here, this is, I, I, I love this image of the building crumbling and with this brand new hat. So this is all now being installed. Um, as we speak. The excavations were extraordinary, and, and the health and safety in that country is uh, another topic. Uh, very scary, and I constantly kept sort of complaining about that. But the interesting thing is once you start seeing the interventions in these buildings in the classical period, and the Gothic period, and then the SSA period, <laughs> all sort of interlinked, and we're, we're trying to show that this is the restaurant with the excavation and the roof. Um, and you can see here, this is a view from the roof. So this will be all a reflective roof. And so this tree here and birds, etc., cetera, will, will all um, uh, reflect on that. And you can see it from underneath. Um, incredible damages to the building and this very slow, painful, and yet you know, loving restoration. This is the church. And we're just essentially slowly restoring and repairing these buildings that have been left in this repair. And this is some of, some of the people in the office enjoying the sites. Um, Alexandria Opera House, this started as a project that we did in Alexandria. And, um, and the site was complicated because it belonged to the Navy. But the client that we were doing it for liked it so much that now they've asked us to do the same, uh, not in Alexandria, but in Elguna and another place in, in, uh, in Egypt. Um, but, um, but Alexandria was is this, uh, once we started doing the research of, of, of the city, this was Cleopatra's city. You can see, to me, this looks like Manhattan with the grid. Uh, I found this really extraordinary. Uh, the Pharaoh's Island, which was adjacent to old Alexandria, is our site. Um, the lighthouse, the famous lighthouse of Alexandria, sat just adjacent to our site, where now there's a citadel. Um, and there was this wonderful history of that coast, the, the Mediterranean coast of, of Egypt. Um, there is a, um, our site is right here. There is a French archaeologist who went researching or, or went diving and found all these wonderful um, statues that had sunken. So Alexandria, um, at some point, there was uh, earthquakes, and the whole city sunk, and the whole sculpture sunk. So it went from a, a vibrant metropolis uh, to uh, essentially a ruined uh, city and slowly rebuilt itself over time. But what happened is that all of this wonderful archaeology and the scale of this archaeology below ground is quite something and still needs to be discovered. Um, and there was a, an exhibition at the British Museum that was called Sunken City, um, Cities, Egypt's Lost World. And to us, this really became a, a starting point for the project. You can see here is our site. Um, it's <clears throat> surrounded by some very important landmarks. The Ras El Tin Palace is a presidential palace, which is still in use. Uh, totally invisible to the, to the public, because you cannot see it from anywhere. You cannot access it. Um, there is a mosque adjacent to the site. This is all a, a, the Navy site. So all of this is a Navy site. Um, the citadel right here, where the Alexandria Lighthouse used to be, and then the Biblioteca by Snohetta, um, which was built a few years back. The city is crumbling. Um, it's, uh, it's actually, it really does need a lot of regeneration. And this was, an, uh, the idea of this project was to promote regeneration. And you can see all the buildings are kind of slightly inclining to the right and the left. And that's because there is an enormous uh, city of, of cisterns, system of cisterns that was built during Cleopatra's time. And, um, and the foundations are sort of haphazardly put on it. This is Ras El Tin Palace adjacent to it, a very important feature, which you can kind of see here in the background. And this mosque, literally adjacent to our site. We wanted to come up with an architecture that wasn't pastiche to, to the region, but was inspired by the region. And actually, the Moorish architecture 
They invented the arch. Uh, this is where the arch started, and you can see it through Byzantine times and, and the contemporary times, how it's sort of been an important feature. So that was one of the aspects that we wanted to play with, with this notion of an arched um, edge to the building, but also the scale, the scale of uh, the, the, the architecture, this monumental scale of architecture in Egypt is very important, and you can see it here in, in Luxor, how the scale of these, these, these buildings essentially are, are uniquely Egyptian, I think. Um, so <clears throat> we did a master plan, I'm not showing you any of the master plan because it's less exciting than than the Opera House, but it's essentially a waterfront, Mediterranean waterfront uh, zone. It's adjacent to this restricted army compound. So they, they, they were all these uh, requirements not to have anyone come close to it, not, a, it, not to have anyone overlook it. There was a height restriction, etc. So we decided to use this idea of water and we created a a water, uh, we extended essentially the Mediterranean into the site that created a natural buffer between the public and the restricted zones. Um, and then essentially we created a square in, in the middle of this water. Um, and then we played with the, the mosque and we started forming um, the, the hall. And this is an opera hall, so with the fly tower, etc. And then we had to protect the foyer and sort of uh, think of a, an architecture that, that would enclose the building. And so we played with this notion of arches uh, around the edge of the building. And you can see here how, how this uh, came about. But really, how do we create a language for, for these arches that was not mimicking, but essentially uh, was referring back to an arched uh, perimeter, uh, a cloistered perimeter? So what the first move we did was actually to stagger the arches so they're not one next to the other and it creates something slightly different and it sort of creates these very monumental uh, viewpoints but also once you're underneath slightly gothic uh, kind of uh, architecture and you can see here the model and how the reflection of the, the, the water essentially doubles the height of, of this space and I think the scale was ambitious, is ambitious um, but uh, I, I, um, I think it sort of uh, it warrants, uh, warrants the area. And you can see, so that one of the elements that we asked the government to do is to consider extending the brief from an opera house to an opera house that also houses a museum of the sunken city because this is so unique to Alexandria and to be able to recover some of the sculptures that uh, would be found on the site and around the site and create um, not just an opera but a place to come and visit those um, sculptures. And you can see here the scale, the elevations, a very simple plan, um, auditorium, fly towers. Um, we needed to have a separate entrance for VIP and this is the presidential entrance and then the public entrance comes from the square, uh, this new square that we created into the area. And you can see the scale of, of, uh, of this. And this is an early rendering of the, the auditorium, which I completely want to change. Anyway, moving on. The last project, this is a, uh, we were invited to a competition in Dubai. Dubai is a very uh, strange place, very exciting. I mean, it's a city that's essentially built in one generation. And I think you have to take your hat off to that. It's sort of the vision is quite extraordinary, but with that comes with the fact that it sort of fluctuates and, and it sort of, you know, everything is getting built and everything stops and that happens every three months. And so, um, but the ambition is definitely there. Um, <clears throat> the, the Bourg Dubai, which is an absolutely wonderful building, and you can see I found this uh, rendering online, but it's uh, a kilometer tall building, um, <clears throat> was built by the client, Imar, and uh, and they were with Calatrava, they had a competition and Calatrava won, but they were proposing a new building which is essentially like the Eiffel Tower. It has no function except it's a viewing platform a kilometer up in the sky. And it's interesting to see how one speaks to the other. Um, uh, this is the vision that we were given. This is very Dubai, it's, you know, it's, uh, it's colorful, let's say. Um, and we were to be one of the buildings around the perimeter um, and you can see here that this is at the perimeter of the, uh, of the site, there's a half a kilometer long retail mall, 
another very uh, Dubai thing, but just sort of absolutely, every, the scale of everything is absolutely enormous. And then this large plaza, and our site was sitting on a podium 18 meters above, uh, um, uh, sorry, eight meters above street level um, with a tower up above it. Um, <clears throat> this is the retail mall that we were given. Um, and, uh, and then the treatment of really this podium and what you do with it. And so we thought, well, you have such a show with this tower and it's such a large public space that we really should do something like this, like the Spanish Steps. And we should allow the public to sort of sit there and have some perspective because the whole master plan sort of you know, had these buildings at the perimeter and you were never ha able to have this perspective of this gigantic tower. So that was one of the first moves is really to create these Spanish steps overlooking the Calatrava Tower and then the retail uh, along this pedestrian street and then to the back we have, this is where the, oops, sorry, there we go, the conference center and then a ramp to access for the drop-off of this uh, tower. The tower is 30% hotel, 70% serviced apartment, uh, apartments, and, and then a parking and loading uh, at the very back here. This was a brief, so nothing, uh, nothing extraordinary except the 300-meter tower. And just to give you a context, this is the size of the shard. They're doing 12 of them on the site, so it's, sort of, uh, it's, uh, it's quite extraordinary. Um, but they wanted a very high efficiency, so there was enormous amounts of uh, documentation on that. They wanted balconies at every level, which uh, is very difficult in terms of making a building that appears elegant, I'd say, with, with uh, balconies. Um, we was, that was what we were initially struggling with. And then they wanted an interesting shape. And frankly, that was the thing where my heart sank, because I just thought, oh, God, another shape. And, and what's so interesting about a shape? Um, so th that was essentially the brief that we worked with. The, the most efficient <coughs> plan for this type of building is essentially a core with the rooms around it. And these are apartments and these are the hotel rooms and that gives you the kind of efficiencies that you're looking for. So this is really the most efficient building that you can do. It's not a very interesting shape. So how do you work with that? And so then we decided to play with this idea of the balconies. And <coughs> we literally built this model in half a day in the office. And then what we discovered is actually that these balconies, which go from eight meters at the bottom to zero meters at the top, were creating this moiré effect and was creating this texturizing to the facade without us having even put a color to it or even having uh, put a material to it. So that was the, the, you know, the eureka moment for this project is that when we saw that and we thought, okay, well now we have an idea that we can play with. This is the scale of what we're talking about. So this is the size of the shard. You can imagine now what this is like. Um, now, in terms of the balconies, we wanted to have a rationale that actually is pragmatic. And so we say that after the 40th floor, there is some kind of urban disengagement that you are no longer relating to the street. And therefore, the balconies become a little bit less um, uh, uh, necessary. And also, the wind speeds dramatically increase at the top level. So again, the balconies become less usable at the upper levels and they are quite pleasant at the lower levels. One of the other aspects is that the, we wanted a connection with the, the street at the lower level. So then we recess the balconies again and we put all the public elements at the lower levels and just uh, a I can never say that word, apologies. But this notion of um, looking at the street while never being seen again became a, a theme to this where you could be up here and looking at the street without really being seen. And that allowed us to create swimming pools and spas and places where modesty was required without being overlooked by all the neighboring buildings. And so we, some of the spaces are open air and allow this to, to f fit within, um, within uh, the floor plate. Uh, this is the, the podium level where you have a drop off and you have an entrance for hotel, one for residents, and then the Spanish steps overlooking the Calatrava Tower. This is a typical uh, hotel bed uh, room, um, sorry, and this is the apartment rooms. But you can see here this very, very simple elevation and, uh, um, and creating a cut at the corner just to create some kind of variety. But this idea that these balconies, which are very thin and they are clad, and I'll show you what the, the ideas of the cladding, but that we really push the, 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 the handrail back so that you never at any point see people 
uh, uh, plants or handrails and that it's a very, very clean, simple elevation of just these floating plates that go from uh, being eight meters deep and having deep shadows to having zero shadows. And here, up here now, you see the reflection of the glass and it sort of becomes a little bit darker. So the color scheme really was done by the shadows rather than the materiality. And um, you, this is one of the views at the upper level. So just showing the client that we have balconies everywhere. But the color scheme really was, in, was in, um, inspired by the desert. And the desert, it goes from a gold to a white or a gray. And so we wanted to um, uh, replicate this. And so we started looking at different ways of doing that with terracotta and um, different colors. And here you see the base of it. It's quite, so you can see how behind these plants, the handrail is always recessed and it just appears like horizontal floating plates with no apparent structure. The unstable equilibrium idea and the en entrance. And there we go. That's it. I'd love to, yeah. Yes? I'm so, I can't hear. No, I mean, they, they, well, the maximum is 13 meters. Yeah, so, so, so we initially we designed it so that it's the whole thing is 22 meters and that they, they weld on site and then they buff on site. But to bring the Japanese workmanship to Lithuania just made it cost prohibitive. So then I, I agreed to a few joint lines. <laughs> There is absolutely, absolutely, yeah, yeah. It's 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 polished stainless steel, yeah. And it's but it's the same with the glass. At some point, we were looking at 12 meter tall glass, and the glass is it's it, it used to be that the the autoclave was a determining factor of the size of the glass, and now it's much more transport because now you are getting autoclaves that can do 12, 13 meter glass. And it's just how do you get a piece that size onto a site, especially in a World Heritage Site with little winding roads. So all of that had to be, had to be looked at. Yeah. OK, the students. I want a question from the students. I can pick one, maybe. Yes. <laughs> Lupo. <laughs> Hi. It's a really, I mean, it's a really interesting point. And, and I'm glad that Raphael is sitting at the back, because when I s set up his office here, all the projects were very large. They were sort of 60 million pounds and up. And, and then when I, when I set up my own practice, we were doing a house in Zimbabwe. And it's, you know, it's not a small sort of tiny project. It was quite an ambitious project. But it went from having meetings with 25 consultants and clients and suits um, and sort of with endless charts. And, and then suddenly I was having meetings over a bottle of wine with two people. And it just became a very different approach. And I had to adapt because I was probably over professional for, for them. And it just, they were, you know, they were slightly giggling about it. But it just, it became, it was sort of a reconnection to the human scale that was very nice. 
and it's something that surprised me and I hadn't, I was, you know, worried that I would never get a job and blah, blah, blah. And then, um, and actually that surprised me and it surprised how much I enjoyed it. So we keep now doing, we are all thriving for the bigger projects because they're great and they're interesting, but we always keep small projects in the office and, and we, we deal with both and it's, it is interesting and on the human level it's very different, but also in terms of the level of detail that is required from a, an individual on a small project versus a larger project, which is usually a client rep, um, is very, very different. And so it forces you um, to, you can't, you can, it's probably more difficult, the smaller ones, to a certain level. It's, it's much more personal, it's, it's uh, there's more hand-holding, it's, you know, it's, it's more frightening because the people usually are not they're not from the building industry, whereas the larger projects, you have project managers, ex-architects, QS, is, I mean, you name it, they've all been in that industry for a while, so they understand it a little bit better. Yeah. I think so. I think it's, I mean, there is that, and I think that a building sits in a landscape, whether it's an urban landscape or a green landscape, it sort of somehow has to fit. And a lot of times it also has to do with the softening of the building and using other materials rather than just um, prefabricated materials to use more natural materials and live materials. So it's another, uh, yeah, it's, I guess it's just another material but it does it does come up a lot and and it's about sort of softening or allowing the building to change over time so thank you well that's it thank you for listening thank you